So this morning we're going to wrap up our summer sermon series in the book of Proverbs. And as we do that, it's an indicator that at least for our teachers and students, uh, summer is beginning to come to an end. Some are sad about that. Some are glad. Um, I polled uh, my three kids who were in the first service. Two of them were sad and one was glad, ready for school to start back. If you know my kids, you can probably guess which were which. <clears throat> and so regardless of how you feel about it, um, the clock keeps ticking and days keep rolling by. Um, it's the nature of seasons. They come and go. Um, and with each one of those seasons, there is necessary and needed change. Uh, normally, by the time uh, one season, if we're literally talking about the seasons, uh, winter, spring, summer, fall, by the end of one, most of us are kind of ready for what's coming next. Now, <clears throat> do you have a favorite season? How many of you would say winter is your favorite? So one, two, I can literally two people in this service. <laughs> Not a lot of winter people. <clears throat> That's all right. How about spring? Anybody love spring? Lots of spring people. How about summer? Yeah, and fall. Okay, fall <clears throat> one in the first service too. <clears throat> I think it's because you get to reap the rewards of the hard work of summer or college football. It's one or the other, right? <laughs> it's just, it's like a toss-up. It's one or the other. So, um. We, we may look forward to the new life that, that kind of springs forth in spring. Um, the Bible talks a lot about seasons. It talks a lot about uh, life. Uh, this particular Proverbs, it talks a lot about life. It also talks a lot about death. Um, you see that throughout the book of Proverbs. When we say something is life or death, we mean that it's really, really important. Maybe it's of the utmost importance um, when we say something is life or death. Now, normally it's an exaggeration when we say that because normally it's not going to result in the death of someone or something if, if it goes a certain way or doesn't go the right way. Um, but we understand the sentiment, right? Um, often we say it in the reverse. We actually say it's not life or death or it's not life and death. It's just not that important. It's a big deal, but maybe it's not quite that important. Uh, we see these themes in Proverbs a lot of life and death. The words life and live occur around 66 times in the book of Proverbs. Um, the words death and die appear somewhere around 20 times. Uh, but life is more than having a pulse. And Proverbs wants us to also see uh, and understand that death isn't just the moment we stop breathing and our heart stops beating. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, Death has been a part of everyone's everyday life. It's a part of your life. Death is already there. Um, you see it in different forms. We see it in sickness, disease, aging. It's part of it. Um, it. It encroaches on our life now with fear and guilt and anxiety and, of course, sin. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man... And death through sin. And this way death spread to all people because all sinned. It's come to everyone. Every man, every woman. Sin is there and death along with it. And as sinners we have a tendency to veer towards sin. And towards Sometimes we're easily tempted. We're easily pulled astray. We veer off into darkness to one extent or another. Maybe even on a daily basis. So Proverbs isn't here just to give us these kernels of wisdom, but it also um, alerts us to the places where death and sin lurk. Now, I, when I'm driving and need directions, I use a, a Maps app. How many of you guys do that? Are you, you can't get anywhere, maybe without Google Maps. I started using one a while back called Waze. Have you all ever used Waze? Um, Waze is kind of interesting because it's like a project where the people who use it are a part of the app experience. And in that, I mean, like, if I'm driving along and I notice there's a car broken down on the side of the road with a couple little taps, I can indicate that there's a car broken down. And so everybody who comes after me, it'll alert them that, hey, take caution, there's a vehicle stopped on the side of the road. You, you can actually also report um, if there are police officers out. Some of y'all, that's the only reason you're using it. Um, I can't imagine why you would do that. I just, 
And so, but you, with one little tap, you can, you can actually indicate if there's a police officer, if he's visible or if he's hidden, like if he's tucked himself up in, you know, because sometimes some of those guys do that, you know. I don't know why they have to do that because we're all such law-abiding citizens, but you can indicate that, okay, and you can see it. You can see it on the app. Oh, there's a police officer up here on the right, and he's hidden. I better slow my roll. So think of Proverbs, and really, as you work your way through Scripture, think of it, not, don't simplify it completely to that point, but understand this. Proverbs in there just give you these little kernels of wisdom. It is continually alerting you to places where problems lurk. It's alerting you. So when it comes to how you handle your money, when it comes to relationships, it's alerting you to places where there, a problem is going to come up, where death exists uh, for instance, when Proverbs warns against sexual sin, it says the dead are there. So when you sin sexually, it's saying that's where death is. It lurks there. If, if you have sinned in that way, in a relationship, in your marriage, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. You, you've seen the effects. You've seen death come in. It can kill and it can steal and it can destroy. On the contrary, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. Now, we started this series by saying that the pursuit of wisdom and any journey through the book of Proverbs is ultimately a pursuit of Jesus Christ because he is the wisdom of God. It is a journey into not just accumulating more information, but into knowing Jesus more fully. And here's what you have to know. If sin and death are a part of your everyday life because you're a human, God wants you to die less and live more. Jesus wants you to not just have life, but to have abundant life. To me, there's an implication there that I can follow Jesus, but not fully experience everything Jesus has for me. Some of you guys could be a witness to that. You've been following Jesus for many years, and you know what it's like to claim Christ, to have received that love and forgiveness, but to not have fully experienced it, the richness of what he has for you. And so, for the book of Proverbs, it really, we look at things and go, well, that's not life or death. But for the book of Proverbs, in many ways, it says almost everything is life or death. And we're going to see a little bit more about that as we work our way through the message this morning. The first thing is this. If we're talking about life or death, we're talking about choosing paths. Proverbs twelve twenty eight says, there is life in the path of righteousness. And in its path, there is no death. So that's a path where there is life and no death. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. So that's two different paths, right? There's a path of righteousness, no death. There's a path, and actually it's one that seems right by our nature to us. It's actually the path to death. Which, are, which one are we going to choose? Proverbs 10, 17, The one who follows instruction is on the path to life, but the one who rejects correction goes astray. There are paths to be chosen, path, the way, even the end. This is the, the key metaphor here. There is a destination for each one of us, an end. We often think about this as uh, life after death, or what are we going to do, where are we going to be after we die? Have, have you ever been asked that question? Do you know for sure where you'll go when you die? Heaven or hell, that's right. And apparently, according to God's word, according to Proverbs, if you've been in the word very much at all, you know this. There are two paths. We choose a path. We choose life or we choose death. Proverbs 30, verse, or not Proverbs, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, Old Testament. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. You, you get to choose a path. Everyone gets to choose. The choice is set before you. Life or death, blessing or curse. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a way, that's a path. The path, the way. Choosing Jesus is choosing the path of life. Before Christians were ever called Christians, they were simply called followers of the way. I love that. 
followers of the way. I mean, that's, that's what a follower of Jesus is because he is the way. We're making a choice. We're choosing paths. And ultimately, if we're going to think about this when it comes to our day-to-day life, we must first think about what path have we set ourselves out on to begin with. Everyone makes a choice. But here's the truth. If you haven't chosen the path of life, you need to know this. You are actually already on the path to death. You come into this world, your little eyes open, you take that first breath, you let out that first scream. I heard a little baby cry out a little bit earlier as we were kind of wrapping up the music. And some of you guys were thinking, why is there a baby in here? I'm thinking, hey, look at that little bitty tiny baby screaming. Some of y'all wish you could scream that high. You can't, you can't close to making a noise like that. From that very first moment, know this, that little baby, before it can ever take a step, is already on a path. It's already on a path. Romans 5, 12. Just as sin entered the world through one man, death through sin, and this way death spread to all people because all sinned. Every single one of us. All sinners, all on that path by default. Not choosing the path of life is making a choice. There's a default position. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. There's a really broad road because it's, it's broad because it's so packed. It's so crowded because it's the default position that all of us enter this world in. The first step we take into this life is a, is a step onto the path towards death because sin has already come to us through Adam. Sin and death right along with it. But for each one of us, there's been a choice set before us. You can stay on that path or you can choose. It's a narrower path because not as many people find it. Make that choice. There is a path, there is a road, and a choice must be made. And the choice we make absolutely determines our final destination, where we land when this life is over. But there's more to it than that. There's also the daily choices that we make that either move us deeper into life or into the realm of darkness and death. And following Jesus moves us further into life. Now we said that there's an implication, right? That Jesus said, I came that they may have life and that they may have it in abundance. There's an implication that we can choose Jesus Christ But as we make those daily choices, we can make choices that take us further into that life or that take us off track. How many of you would be willing to raise your hand and admit that in your time following Jesus, if you're a follower of Christ, you have gotten off track? Some of you spent decades there. Because you chose you, you, knew, you knew that path, you knew who Jesus Christ was, but you were consistently making daily choices that weren't leading you further into life. This is that abundant life that Jesus wants us to live. So not only do we, must we choose life over death by choosing to trust Christ, repent of our sins, uh, repent of our sinfulness, receiving his righteousness, we must also see that each day and in each moment, choices are set before us, living or dying, blessing or curses. So here's my question. Which path will you choose with your very next decision? I'm not talking about a choice to deny Christ. I'm talking about in those little, small choices. For the book of Proverbs, all of these choices are life and death because they are leading us either deeper into the life of Christ or they are pulling us away. And all of us have seen the effects that death and sin brings when we veer off. Uh, so many of you raised your hand and said, in your time walking with Jesus, you got off track. We don't have enough time this morning for us to line up and come up and tell all of the negative effects and all the ways that we saw death and destruction come into our life. How the enemy came to steal and to kill and to destroy. He wrecked our finances. He wrecked our marriages. He wrecked our relationships. He wrecked our employment. We can absolutely still experience those effects of death 
And so Proverbs is saying, hey, warning, up ahead, on the right, you're going to be tempted to be unfaithful. You're going to be tempted to be dishonest. You're going to be tempted to use your words to tear down instead of build up. It's constantly warning us and preparing us for what is next and what is coming ahead. Proverbs 12, 28, again, there is life in the path of righteousness, and in its path there is no death. Each of those moments when we choose sin over righteousness, we veer off into death. But you see, our nature is to give ourselves to something. That, that's, that's wired into us. When we make a choice, we are giving ourselves to whatever that choice is. Let me give you an example. When you take a job, you are choosing to give yourself at least your time, and hopefully your intellect and your work ethic and all those things, to that job, to that employer, for a certain amount of time, each day, each week, each year, for a certain amount of money. But you've given yourself there. When I, when I get, got married to Sarah, I gave myself to her. When it came to that kind of relationship, I can't give myself to anybody else because I've given myself there. Our nature is to give ourselves to something. That's what we do. And so what we don't realize is that even though we've chosen Christ, we tend to choose side paths along the journey. And they get us off track. And they steal our joy. They steal our freedom. And they actually take life from our days. For many of us, if we think back of those times where we have chosen a path other than what God wanted for us, it's almost like we look at it in slow motion. It's almost like, did, was I even really living in that moment? But then we, we hear the stories of the people who have been redeemed, the people who have been revived, the people who have been restored from that life. And they're like, I actually feel like this is actually living. I'm actually, I actually am getting more out of each day. I'm getting more out of my relationships. I'm actually experiencing life in a deeper, more full way. In Romans 6, it says this, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So you're a slave to sin, and you're free from righteousness. You don't got any righteousness. You're free of that. So what fruit was produced then from the things you're now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. When we were slaves to sin, when we gave ourselves to sin, all we produced were things we're ashamed of, things that led to death. And he says this, But now, since you've been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit which results in sanctification and the outcome is eternal life. Two paths are set before us, life and death. In each moment, in each even seemingly small decision, we must ask ourselves, is this taking me towards life and towards a more rich and deep and meaningful relationship with Christ, or is this taking me away? It actually makes a lot of decisions much more clear. It's not that one is inherently evil, but is this taking me further and closer to Jesus or is it pulling me away? There are perfectly good and enjoyable things that we can do in this life. But if we look at them on the grid of life and death, they're not taking us closer to Jesus. They're actually one degree at a time pulling us away from him. It may be pulling our time, pulling our attention, pulling our finances away from the things that bring life. And don't believe the lie that submitting to Christ restricts your freedom. It unlocks it. It actually leads to more life. It leads to eternal life. Think of this eternal life as life that continues to overflow. There's always more of it available. It doesn't run out. There's always more waiting beyond the next turn, Beyond the, the, that difficult moment, that difficult decision, that difficult season of life, there's always more life available to you. The alternative is to be enslaved to sin and to be enslaved to ourselves and our own desires and our own silliness and pettiness and foolishness. And on that path, there's no life. Because God doesn't just want to give you eternal life when you die. He wants to give you an abundant life that begins right now. I remember as, as a kid, every time I thought about salvation and thought about eternal life, I always thought about it as something that would kick in when I died. And it was like I was going to live this life, and then when I died, eternal life would be there waiting for me. 
you know? And so I remember even as a kid thinking, man, in like 60 or 70 years when I die, that eternal life thing is going to be great. But if, if you read John 3, 16, he says what? For God loved the world in this way that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. Now, I would get it later. If you're in Christ, you have eternal life right now. It is there. It is waiting for you. I don't want to be enslaved to sin. I don't want to be enslaved to the things that are going to bring death and destruction to my life. I want to be on a path that leads me deeper into Christ and deeper into his life. Is the path that I'm on leading to life? Jesus came for me, he loved me, he redeemed me, he set me free, and he has given me life, and in each moment he wants to continue to. But it's not just that. People who follow Jesus shouldn't just be living this this life, and Jesus who continues to give us life, we should be the most life-giving people. We should be giving life to others. In other words, the life of Christ should spread, and the way he's chosen to spread that is through life-giving people. See, death came through Adam and Eve, and it infected everyone who would ever come, all their descendants, every single one of us. Death and sin is there. And Jesus came to give new life. And the way he spreads that is through us. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning people away from the snares of death. Proverbs 13, 14, a wise person's instruction is a fountain of life turning people away from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord's internal, it's personal. It's a fountain of life that turns me away from snares. But a wise person's teaching is external. It's public. And it spreads life to other people. The people who have not yet passed from darkness to life, the people who haven't experienced the love and forgiveness of Jesus, you may call them lost, They don't just need my personal, private relationship with Jesus. They need my public, vocal fear of the Lord and life-giving words of the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. They need both. Jesus is the life, and he pours out like a fountain. It's internal and it's external. In John 4, Jesus said, Whoever drinks from the water I give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. It's always there. There's always more. It's springing up. The fear of the Lord, it's like a fountain of life. There's more and more of it there. As we grow in the fear of the Lord, it says it's the beginning of wisdom, and as his wisdom is, it just continues to flow. And we continue to encounter situations and decisions and choices And we know the right choice to make, the one that will lead us to life. But it's not just that. It overflows out of us. And our wise instruction, our life-giving words, point people. There's actually two metaphors we see in the book of Proverbs for this. There is a fountain and there is a tree, the tree of life. It was in the center of the garden. Adam and Eve could go and eat from the tree of life every day until the moment they sinned. And then they were cast out of the garden. And it was sealed off to never be able to access the tree of life in this world again. But we still need it. People still need it. And they get to experience it through us, through life-giving words. Proverbs 15, 4, the tongue that heals is a tree of life. Proverbs eleven thirty: the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And a wise person captivates people. In some translations, that actually reads, a wise person wins souls. It's life and death. And our world is full of people who desperately need life. They desperately need the life-giving love of Jesus. And they will experience it through our life-giving words. It's like a tree of life. God wants all men and women everywhere to come to him and to experience his life. 
And our words will not only win us friends, but they will win people to the life-giving love of Jesus. This is life and death. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Two choices are set before us. Two paths. Choose life that you may live and your descendants. Look at one more thing. The life of Christ gives lasting hope. Proverbs 24, verse 13. Eat honey, my son, for it is good, and the honeycomb is sweet to your palate. Let me get this. Realize that wisdom is the same. It's sweet. If you find it, you will have a future, and your hope will never fade. For each one of us, there are two paths. We can choose the life that Jesus Christ offers, or we can choose to stay on the path of death that we come into this world on. But for those who choose Christ, know this. Along the way, there are going to be millions and millions of tiny decisions. You make thousands of decisions a day, many without even thinking. They're second nature. They come from the way you were raised, uh, the environment that you grew up in, all of those things. They, they come from uh, having experienced things before. Um, you, you make a choice not to put your hand on a hot iron because you accidentally bumped into a hot iron once when you were little. You don't have to think about it again. You don't go, huh, should I touch the hot iron? Right? Thousands and thousands of decisions. You never think about which one you should choose. You just make the choice. It's intuitive. Do we not realize that God promises that those who fear him will grow in wisdom and his wisdom will come into your heart and it will change the way you think and it will give you discernment to be able to make choices that consistently lead you deeper into life. You won't even know why you chose it because his wisdom will have come into your heart. That's why when we see people who consistently make these decisions and they're following Christ more and more, they're not just some amazing, amazing believers. They've got some special gift that we can never have access to. They have grown in wisdom. And God's wisdom has changed the way they see this world. And just like you know not to touch the hot iron, not to run out into traffic, you know all of these things. There's like second nature when it comes to all these hundreds and hundreds of what seem to be meaningless, but are life and death decisions. Through wisdom and through Jesus Christ, you will consistently choose life. So let's take a moment and respond to that. Let's ask God for wisdom. He promises in his word that he will give it to us. And let's pursue it through knowing Christ better. But I have one other thing. If you're one of those people who, when you raise your hand, not that you have been off track, but that maybe you actually are off track. Know this, there's no shame with Christ. There is only, come to me and I will give you rest. All the deeds of darkness, they produce shame in us, but repentance never does. Jesus never shames us, he always loves us and accepts us. As we say time and time again, he always responds to repentance with grace. Maybe you've been on a path of darkness and death, and you're reaping all of the negative rewards Today's the day to come back.